There was a point in the first D&D stream we did, the solo game with me and Gertz, where I could tell, or at least I believed, that Gertz was lost at sea. He was the only player in a game world he knew very little about, playing with a new DM he hadn't played with before, and he didn't know what his options were. I think he was afraid I was going to let him get in over his head. He had an NPC follower, a cleric named Edric, who was a lot of fun to roleplay, and when things got hairy, he started trying to extract information from Edric to guide his decisions. But that isn't why I put Edric in the game. I wanted Gertz's character Vorkus to be the hero, and Edric a follower. So I just told him flat out, Edric is a coward. If you ask him what he thinks, he will always pick the least risky option, including running and hiding. But if you have an idea, he'll follow you. He'll support you. If you give him a command, he will obey. He'll trust that you know best. When I watched that session later on Twitch, I noticed the folks in chat react with surprise when I did that. Whoa, he just explicitly said what an NPC's motivation was. Doing something like that had not occurred to the folks watching, and there was an element of, you can't just say that, mixed in with, well, Matt Colville did it, so it must be okay. I hadn't really thought it was that remarkable, but I can see how, if you're a new DM, it might never occur to you to just explicitly say something like that to a player. But you can. You can say... Whatever you want. You're the DM. It's your game. And a big part of your job is controlling the flow of information in the game. That's the subject of this video. Information. How and when to tell your players something, and when not to tell them something. Your players approach the gates to the city. The guards stop them and ask them to state their business before entering. After a little role-playing, one of the players asks, what is this guard's name? You shrug and say, I don't know, who cares? He's just a guard. You just let that player down. They believed in the world. You would convince them it was a real place with real people in it, but when you shrugged and said, I don't know, who cares? You did two things wrong. First, you admitted that not only did you not know, which is not in and of itself a bad thing, you admitted there was no answer, meaning the guard was just a nameless, faceless NPC in your game. He wasn't a real person in a real world, and if you're not interested in presenting your players with a world to believe in, you might as well be playing Warhammer Quest or Descent. Secondly, and arguably more damning, when you shrug and say, who cares, you're strongly implying that the player is wrong to ask, that wanting to believe in the world you've created is a waste of their time. Among the sins of a DM, this must rank near the top. I only got to watch about two minutes of the live audience version of Critical Role, such as my curse, but in that two minutes, I watched one of the players ask Matt what the name of the city's elite guard was. Matt shuffled some papers and said, uh, hang on, let me consult my notes. And after another second or two, he gave up and said, there is an answer, it's in here somewhere. I do that all the time. I tell my players, this NPC knows the answer. I do not right now, but I'll find out and get back to you. That is not the most satisfying answer. It would, of course, be better if I could manifest the name in an instant, and sometimes I can just make something up on the fly. But sometimes you're just stumped, and there's nothing for it but to punt. You'll never be able to instantly answer every question any player might ever have about your world. It's impossible. But you should always strive to imply that there is an answer. It's written down here somewhere. You just need to look it up. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not, and you know it. But something as simple as saying, it's written down here, I just can't find it, helps the players believe in the reality of the world. They believe there is an objective answer, and the fact that it's written down somewhere, and not just made up by you, even when those two things are the same, helps them believe. It's just the nature of the player's psychology. We inherently believe that something written down is more real than something made up on the fly. Sometimes it's okay to say, I have no idea. I say it all the time. When the players ask what will happen if we... I say, I have no idea, or there's only one way to find out, because they're asking about the future. But sometimes I say, no one knows. That's a very different answer than I have no idea. No one knows is a cultural answer about your world. I have no idea is an answer about you as a DM. And no one knows might not be true, because it's a cultural statement. You're telling the players what people believe to be true. Someone on Twitter asked me what there was about being a dragonborn paladin in my world that made them incorruptible. They'd been watching our stream, and you can see how useful the stream was, right? They'd been watching the stream, and I described Good King Omen's dragon phalanx thusly. The dragon knights are incorruptible. What did my players think I meant? I don't know, but someone on Twitter thought I was talking about some game mechanic unique to my Dragonborn Paladins. But I was not. I was conveying a cultural trope. I was quoting people in my world, because that's how they perceive the Dragon Phalanx. It's something I stole from Stephen R. Donaldson's epic, important, influential series, The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever. In those books, we meet the Bloodguard, who are a cadre of immortal, emotionless monks. 
We are the Blood Guard, one of them says. You cannot cast doubt upon us. But, like the Dragon Phalanx, that's not true. It's just how people perceive them. I do that all the time. I tell the players what everyone in the world thinks, and it's up to them to decide what that means. That's called signal fidelity. Can the player trust the information coming from the DM? And I don't believe the answer should always be obvious. When you say, you hit, in combat, the player should 100% trust that. When an NPC smiles and says, trust me, they should 100% not trust that. In both instances, the players know this, and therefore, they have no work to do. You've left them no space for their own interpretation. But when you say something ex cathedra like, no one knows, or the dragon phalanx is incorruptible, you introduce some ambiguity. Some players will wonder, did Matt mean that literally? And they'll start thinking about what such statements mean, and that means they're going to interpret them personally, idiosyncratically, and that means they're being creative. They are inventing their own version of the world where such statements require some interpretation. This can backfire. I told Lars at lunch that right now, the players are making their stealth checks and therefore are able to deal with the Dwagar fortress on their own terms. But eventually, stealth will fail, and the alarms will sound, and suddenly you'll be dealing with the fortress on the Dwagar's terms. And when that happens, you are screwed. Now, for Lars, this was a huge blow, because he interpreted it as me saying, there's no way to win. But you know, I don't think of D&D in terms of winning and losing. If you grew up with Zelda and Final Fantasy and nothing else, then you naturally will think of all games in terms of winning and losing. Of course, in the end, Lars found a way to completely bypass 90% of the fortress, and it was inventive and brilliant, and I loved it. But Lars was really discouraged leading up to that because he felt like eventually they'd fail a stealth check and 100 Dwagar would show up and kill them. And so I was saying their destruction was inevitable. This did not prove true, but that's how Lars interpreted my statement, and it sucked. That's part of the danger of being the DM. You are not in control of how your players interpret what you tell them. It would have been easier if I had had an NPC in the party to convey that information, because then it wouldn't have sounded like an objective fact coming from the DM. You are going to lose. One of the great tools the DM has in their toolbox when it comes to controlling the flow of information is the NPC. I often feel constrained when my players are running around, inside a Dwagar stronghold for instance, and I have no NPC in the party to feed them information with. It's really nice to have an NPC in the party to explain things to the players, or give them ideas, or give them context for their actions. It's much more interesting to hear Sir Arkazovar explain the principles of feudalism to the players than it is to hear me do it, because Sir Arkazovar is the embodiment of that system. Which means not only is he an expert, he also has a point of view. And that makes conveying information interesting. If I tell the players something about how the Baron of Bedegar might be 15 years old, but he outranks a mere knight like Lady Avelina, that's one thing. It's dry and factual. But Sir Arkazovar would put a certain spin on it. She cannot refuse. She is a bonded knight on his land. She must obey. Now, is that literally true? You tell me. Think about it. You know that it's not. When Sir Arkazovar says that, he's doing several things at once. He's saying, this is how feudalism works, and that's certainly true. But he's also saying, and I, Sir Arkazovar, believe in it. He believes in it so strongly, he does not admit the possibility that Lady Avelina might disobey, might think an unfeudal thought. And of course, by stating it so emphatically, so full of conviction, he directly implies that Lady Avelina might not obey. And when that happened in my game, it created drama, as everyone watched Lady Avelina to see what she might do. It worked. Because you play all the NPCs, there is a natural tendency for the players to trust whatever an NPC says as though it is a perfect literal truth. How could it be otherwise? It came from the DM. So I make sure to have the NPCs behave in character. The dwarf NPC recommends they charge in and attack the black dragon. The players stop and think, wow, could we really do that? Could we win? They ask the dwarf, and he says, What better way to die in battle than against an impossible foe? Because my dwarves are basically short Klingons, and the players immediately think, Die? Okay, do not listen to this guy. The coward NPC suggests they flee. The warlock NPC, hungering for knowledge, suggests they light the candle, ring the bell, and open the book. If you do this, you reduce the fidelity of the signal. The players learn we cannot always trust what the DM says. And then they start thinking for themselves, which is the goal. I don't always say, there's only one way to find out, when the players consult the oracle to ask about future events. Sometimes I tell them exactly what I think is going to happen. You know so much more than your players do about what's going on that a big part of your job as a dungeon master is providing context for their actions. In other words, what is likely to happen based on what they want to do. 
When Goethe's character Vorkas was in danger of overreaching, literally, and accidentally ringing a bell in an attempt to cut the bell pole's rope off, I explicitly told him, if you try this and you fail, you will ring the bell and alert all the orcs in the keep. This was another instance where the viewers in Twitch chat said, whoa, he just told Gertz outright what would happen. Of course I did, because it would have been completely obvious to Vorkas. If something would be obvious to the character, make sure it's obvious to the player. It is profoundly unsportsmanlike to trick your players by withholding character information just because the player didn't think to ask for it. It may seem, watching this, as though I am very permissive in allowing a flood of information to flow from me to the players, but that is only because I fear new DMs will do the opposite. Treat information like treasure. Hoard it. But I do not always tell the players what's going on. I might say the following, for instance. See what you make of it. Okay, it's this orc's turn. He readies his weapon and then stops. He surveys the battlefield. He sees many of his comrades dead and appears to make an evaluation. He turns and runs toward the door to the next room. You, the viewer watching this, know very little about the situation. You can't see the battle mat. You don't know who the heroes are, or what level they are, or how many of them there are, or what the orcs are doing, or really anything. But do you know what that orc is trying to do? Yeah, you do. I can tell. The orc is trying to go get reinforcements. Notice how in my description I said everything but he's going to go for reinforcements. That is the conclusion. I gave the players everything they needed to reach that conclusion, but I did not give them the conclusion. I walked right up to the edge of it, and then let them jump off. Even though it may seem obvious to you, one of the things I've learned is that in any given group, there are always players who don't make the connection. Every time this happens in my game, some of the new players will say, he's running away, we've won. But when the other players do make the connection, it makes them seem smart, which is a great feeling. I don't tell the players the monster's stats in combat, but I tell them obvious things like, this one doesn't seem very smart, or this one's in heavy armor, or this one seems lightly armored and agile. The players are then free to interpret that as low wisdom save, high armor class, low dex save, high dex save. These are things the characters would certainly notice, but the players might not be thinking about. They might try to cast Charm Person on a bad guy who is obviously a priest or a shaman and therefore is likely to have a high wisdom stat. The player hasn't made the connection. Go ahead and make it for them. Your job is not to beat the players. Your job is to make sure things unfold in a dramatic but plausible fashion. And it's implausible to imagine the character hasn't considered things like that. I wouldn't tell the players which of the bad guys have the worst wisdom save, for instance. The goal is not to play the game for them, but just saying, okay, you saw this dude cast a spell, so he's probably a shaman or a priest, is enough to get the players thinking. Why did Matt say that? Oh, he probably has a high wisdom save. That is the goal. By letting out a little information, you change how the players perceive the battle overall. Now you don't need to tell them stuff like that every time they choose a target because you changed the way they think. Now they'll do it for themselves. I don't tell the players the monster's armor class until they hit. Then I tell them just because they could decide to keep track of every hit and miss until eventually they pinpoint the real number, but why make them do that? I don't just begin by giving the AC away, though, because the characters don't know the AC. Sure, you know the armor class for a creature in Chain and Shield, but maybe it's magical armor. Maybe they have a high dexterity. I don't tell the players the monster's hit points, but I certainly let them know how effective they're being. I use flowery language to indicate the monster is lightly damaged or heavily wounded. And sometimes, especially at the end of a long battle, I'll just tell the players, this guy has eight hit points left. You could kill him with one blow. Why would I do that? because I want to make that last attack dramatic for the players, so I give them information their characters could never have. I don't do it often. Part of this is just experimenting and learning when this stuff works. You've watched this video, but until you start doing it, you won't know exactly what you can get away with. It will vary from group to group and session to session. Sometimes my players will ask if they can roll to know something. This comes in a few different sizes. Sometimes the player knows nothing, but the character might know something, so they roll, and if they roll well, they get an answer. Also, I have no problem telling a player who rolled badly, you have no idea. Or sometimes I tell them something false, but I try to do it in such a way they know I'm doing it. I want to give them a role-playing opportunity. I'm not literally trying to deceive them. I played with a DM who would routinely say stuff like, the stones of this ruin seem strange. They don't seem to use any mortar. It might be giant made. Well, that offends me right off the bat. It's okay to say something seems unusual about this stonework because it lets the player run with that info. Some players won't care, but the ones who do can make a roll. But then when I would ask the DM, can I figure out how this stuff was made? Because building a fortress like that without using mortar is useful. The DM would ask for a roll. And if I succeed, the DM would say, it's definitely giant made. 
But I knew that before I rolled. What was the point of the roll? If the players succeed, don't merely reinforce something they already suspected. Try to give them some useful information, something they can act on. I think sometimes DMs are afraid that if they give the players useful information, it will break their world. How this item was made was a secret. We can't have everyone knowing how it's done. Well, your players aren't everyone, they're the heroes. It's okay if they figure out your world's secrets. Sometimes players want to know about a monster. If they roll well, I will let the player read the monster manual for a few seconds. Longer if they rolled better. Then take it away. Players love that. I don't give them time to see and memorize everything, but they get something, and it simulates a character's imperfect knowledge. Sometimes the player does know something, and they're rolling to see if their character's knowledge is in accord with their own. If it makes sense that the character might know this, I allow a roll. If they succeed, I give them the information. Sometimes I don't allow a roll. You, the player, heard or read about this a while ago, and your character has probably heard rumors, so let's just assume those two states are equivalent. Go ahead and act on your hazy information however you want. No need to roll. I'm giving the player permission to play their character's knowledge as being approximately the same as their knowledge. And when that's true, you don't need the roll. Sometimes the player wants to roll to remove ambiguity, but I don't think their character actually knows anything. There's no reason a fighter who was a farmer three days ago would know about the plane of fire, for instance. In that case, I'll just tell the player, your character knows nothing about this. It's far beyond the realm of what they might have heard or experienced. I think it's fine to rule, no, you can't roll. It is unreasonable to expect your character would know anything about this, given your background, regardless of how well you would roll. This is especially true of low-level characters. In fact, it's one of the defining characteristics of low-level characters. They don't know much about the wider world yet. And it makes being high level and knowing a lot feel like an accomplishment. It's also true of characters who are from far away. They wanted to play a character from a different culture, an outlander or whatever. Well, this is that. It means not knowing as much about this place as the people who live here. Once, I was the only player in a game who had already played in this campaign before, so I knew a lot about the campaign world, a lot more than the other players. And I knew way more than my character would. I had no problem just pretending like I didn't know. I am a DM, I am used to playing along. But the DM did something cool. He said, well, you're a wizard, you do a lot of research. Let's just assume that research includes history and geography, and you can consult the campaign book whenever you want. He took my knowledge as a player and made it part of what made my character unique. Very cool. Often a character will do something, talk to somebody, go somewhere, that the other players have no access to. When that happens, I typically take the player outside, roleplay with them, and let them come back into the room and relay what happened. I'm not doing this for their benefit. I'm not giving it to reward them, give them some secret knowledge. I'm doing it for the benefit of the other players, because now they get the experience of grilling the player who went outside, and that's fun. Preserving their ignorance and then letting them interrogate the returning player is part of the fun of the game. It accurately simulates the experience of going from not knowing to knowing. Also, often the returning player fails to accurately relay what happened. Not on purpose, they just don't remember it perfectly. I rarely correct them. Unless it's something so memorable and obvious, it's unreasonable the character wouldn't remember. Like, maybe I described the symbol on this evil character's chasuble. The player didn't see it, they just got the description. But the character obviously saw it and would remember it. Sometimes the returning player tries to relay some important dialogue. I do not remind them what the NPC said, because there's no reason their character would remember it any better than the player. I enjoy utilizing a player's imperfect memory to simulate a character's imperfect memory. I used to pass notes to players to give them information with the goal of having them roleplay the act of giving that information to the rest of the group. If the player makes a knowledge roll, meaning their character recognizes this symbol, I pass them a note about it. My hope was that the player would read the note and then convey its information in their own words. But what I noticed is that players typically just read the note out loud which makes me want to slap them. I could have done that. So nowadays I just take them outside and tell them. Now they have no note to refer to. In general, I tell my players things that remove confusion or save time. I do not tell them things that remove drama. I do not tell them things that remove their own agency. Do not tell them how they think or feel. Describe things in such a way that cause them to think or feel the things you want. For instance, I do not tell my players, you're terrified, unless there's a supernatural effect terrifying them. I describe things in what I hope is a terrifying manner. This is not easy, but you get better at it over time. If the players walk into a town, I don't describe this building as smelling of food and sounding like people inside are having a good time. I say, there's a tavern. Because of course the character would know it's a tavern. Why beat around the bush? Why waste time? 
But if they were exploring a ruined town after it was sacked by orcs and burned, that means they don't recognize all the buildings. I might say, this is a large stone building with a huge central chimney. There's a melted slab of metal in the middle of the floor. The players might then conclude, oh, this is the blacksmith shop, and I might then nod, or maybe I'd shrug. I hate descriptive text in adventures that refers to a room in a dungeon or any place the players are trying to explore as obviously a guard room or whatever. Look, the players are exploring this place. Don't tell them what they think. Describe things in such a way as to get them to come to that conclusion on their own. As with many of these videos, a lot of this advice is only going to start to be useful once you start experimenting and failing sometimes and succeeding other times. Controlling what the players are thinking about and what information they have is an art. It's not a science. It's a craft. It's something that you have to exercise your muscles at and you will slowly get better at it. Just remember, every time you fail, you've gotten that much closer to succeeding. Okay, folks, that was the information episode. This is a subject that will expand to fill however much time we give it. But I feel we're really into some next level DM stuff here, so hopefully you found this video useful. I think it's one of the most important videos we've done so far, but you tell me what you think. That's it, folks. I want to remind everybody that I do have a subreddit slash r slash Matt Colville. There'll be a link in the doobly-doo. And as always, I am an independent fantasy author. I write fantasy novels in my spare time. If you want to help support the channel, it's probably the best way to do it. Come by my Amazon page. There's another link in the doobly-doo. I have two books up there. I'm working on my third. Each book is $4, of which I get three bucks. So if you buy both books, I get six bucks. And you get two books, which some people have read and some people have liked. It's always fun when people reach out to me on Twitter, at Matt Colville, and tell me what they thought of the books. I get a huge kick out of that. Okay, folks, that's it. Next video, I think, is going to be a video for new players, kind of giving them some context for what this D&D thing is. I've had a lot of people I work with, a lot of new players, come up to me and ask me questions about this D&D thing because they want to play, they're interested in it, but they have really no context for what they're signing up for. The next video will solve that. Actually, the next video should be a campaign diary because I think we're going to play this Tuesday night, and probably the video after that will be another movie review. I've started doing movie reviews, uh, maybe not every week, but I did one last week on Ghostbusters. I had done one before that on Midnight Special, and I watched a movie over the weekend called Possession from 1981 that was really uh, interesting and deserves to be talked about. But that'll all happen this week. Next Monday will be the video for new players. Until then, peace. Out.